Hi everyone, uh, this is Phil Travis, and uh, this presentation um, involves a discussion of the three Islamic empires that rose to, um, to dominance in their respective region um, at the same time in which we in class have been watching Europe come out of the Middle Ages into the Renaissance, into the Enlightenment period. And these three empires, um, uh, the longest lasting, of course, in the red is the Ottoman Empire, and the Ottoman Empire only co only only collapsed um, officially, at least, at the end of World War One. Though um, the shaded area in red um, is the height of the empire, and uh, you know during World War One, um, there was uh, far less of this territory under control as the empire had weakened su substantially. So the Ottoman Empire. The Safafid Empire, which was centered largely in modern-day Iran, um, and the Mughal dynasty or Mughal Empire that was centered in modern-day India, Pakistan, and parts of Afghanistan. Uh, these empires are all very interesting and unique, um, and so this is what we'll be looking at um, uh, in this presentation. Now... As you see pictured here, this is a, a map, a closer map of the Safafid Empire. Um, you can see that it embodies, it's, it's located, its heart is in modern day Persia, or what we call Iran today, and the capital was, um, for the most of the time, at, at Isfahan, which is centrally located, as you should be able to see on this map, um, in modern day Iran or Persia. Now, um, there's an interesting development here because today, if you follow anything and you under, under, uh, understand anything about Islam in the world today, you know that there's uh, a number of sectarian divisions, most notably the division between Sunni and Shia. And it's really at this time where you see the Sunni and Shia division um, really um, creating... Um, differences and even hostilities between different Islamic groups uh, or different Islamic empires. The Safafid Empire was a Shia empire. Um, and just as today, Iran is a Shia majority country. Uh, the Safafid was a Shia majority um, realm. And um, they believed in, in something called Twelver Shiism, which was a mystical understanding of the Islamic faith. By contrast, their rival, particularly the Ottoman Empire, was primarily Sunni in nature and more um, less, less, in, less interested, the Ottoman were less interested in things like um, magic or the supernatural than they were um, expanding the realm of the Ottoman Empire. But you see this division between Sunni and Shia, which is a division that goes all the way back to the 7th, 7th century, but you really see it um, forming the basis for some of the disputes um, between Islamic groups um, during the period of the Safafid and the Ottoman Empire. This is a look at, uh, this is Safafid art from Isfahan. Um, you'll notice um, these, they were incredibly good horsemen and uh, they used uh, compound bows in battle, um, which was very effective for a period. This is a mosque at Isfahan today. This is a, a Safafid mosque, and you can get a look at this and really get a feel for the intricacy of the artwork here. The other... One of the other dynasties is the interesting, interesting dynasty is the one in modern day India. Um, this was the Mughal dynasty. Um, the Mughal dynasty, which was actually um, one of the first dynasties to um, employ gunpowder weapons. Um, they actually were, were um, so one of the first peoples to adopt the usage of matchlock, of matchlock firepower, fire, um, gunpowder weapons, um, uh, firearms. Now, um, the Safafid, by contrast, the Safafid, would, they would refuse to use gunpowder weapons often, often because they believed it was un, unmanly and it was not sophisticated. And so the Safafid were dealt some crushing defeats, particularly at the hands of the Ottomans, 
um, largely because of their refusal to adopt um, the use of, 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 of firearms. Um, instead, they turn to mysticism to try to uh, protect themselves from the bullets, which, of course, did not work too well. But the Mughal did advance. They did use um, advanced gunpowder technology early on. The Mughal dynasty was actually, um, this is a depiction, as you see right there, this is a depiction of Babur in battle. Babur was the founder of the Mughal dynasty. And you'll notice in this, uh, if you look at this, you'll notice the compound bow, which was an integral element to um, uh, Mughal warfare. And Babur and the Mughals were descendants of the Mongols. So um, much of the equestrian skills and the usage of the compound bow were still um, widespread. And they were very, very effective warriors. Um, and they controlled Afghanistan, northern India, and ultimately much of the entirety of the Indian subcontinent was controlled by the Mughals. Now, um, some of the greatest leaders excuse me, some of the greatest leaders in the Mughal dynasty were individuals like Babur and Akbar, but actually the most impressive architectural development of the Mughal was the, was the Taj Mahal, which was built by Shah Jahan. And he built this for his wife. And interestingly, um, Jahan was actually imprisoned by his son, Aurangzeb, who became perhaps the greatest of the Mughal leaders. Um, the politics in the Islamic empires, uh, you, you might immediately say, wow, he imprisoned his dad. Um, the politics in, the, in these empires was very cutthroat. There was, no, there was no process for which authority was passed through. Instead, um, when a king died, there was oftentimes um, a great deal of infighting and struggle to try and maintain political power. And so it was very common in these empires for powerful warriors um, to overthrow a leader. And Shah Jahan was overthrown. He was thrown in jail. And uh, apparently he could see the Taj Mahal, which he built for his wife, um, from a small cell. But he spent the remainder of his life in prison because he was ousted as a leader. There were other leaders, like in the Ottoman, who went to great lengths to eliminate, to isolate or even kill um, other, other competitors who could even be family members, uh, competitors to the throne. So they were, they were very, very, very um, uh, ruthless when it came to obtaining and maintaining political and military power. Akbar, Akbar the Great, who's pictured in the, the blue background with the, with the lion, um, Akbar the Great, he was the grandson of Babur. Babur is the founder of the Mughal dynasty. Akbar was one of the great leaders of the Mughal. And his, his father was, was not necessarily so. His father's pictured in the green there. And in fact, his father was blamed for losing much of the empire. But Akbar, by contrast, um, expanded the empire and was noted for his religious, to religious tolerance. Um, he accepted the presence of Hinduism, Sikhism, Christianity, um, Buddhism, and also, of course, Islam. And it actually, at one time, Akbar even tried to create his own religion, which was like a fusion of these different um, faiths on the Indian subcontinent. Um, and it could be said that uh, he was considered probably the most noble and the greatest of the, of, the, of the leaders of the Mughal dynasty, overseeing it really at its peak. Now, to get to the, to the last one, um, this is just general overviews, of course, um, but the Ottoman Empire. And basically what you look at, what you see on this map, um, all of the colored area um, if you go to the extent of all the colored area, that represents the, um, the full extent of the Ottoman dynasty, the Ottoman Empire, which was an incredibly long-lived and powerful empire. It lasted, like I said, uh, it did not collapse technically until uh, the end of World War I. Of course, at the end of World War I, there was um, not much left of the empire. Um, this, this, this kind of height of territorial expansion you know, was, of course, not something that could last for a very long time. And ultimately, when the Ottoman Empire did decline, um, it came so largely at the control and influence of European powers 
um, in the, particularly in the 1800s. This is a look, I'm, I'm trying to show you guys a good amount of art and architecture from um, these dynasties. And this right here is the Hagia Sophia. It's a mosque today. It's located in Istanbul. It was originally a church built by the Byzantine emperor Justinian, and it was built in the 6th century. Um, Justinian, the Byzantine was um, an Orthodox Christian kingdom that was really a continuation of the Roman Empire and remained intact from its center at Constantinople until 1453 when the Sultan Mehmed II conquered Constantinople in one of the most significant or landmark moments in, uh, in world history. Um, but here it is and it's massive. The, the domes on the, on the structure here were mass, are absolutely massive. And um, actually, um, during Justinian's time, the, the main dome was, was a true marvel of engineering. This is the Blue Mosque, which is also located in Istanbul. Another example of Ottoman, um, of Ottoman um, architecture. And of course, the mosques, you notice, have the so-called prayer towers around the corners are called minarets. And uh, the minarets are, um, are, are always the case with uh, these major mosques in um, the former Islamic empires. Minarets are very identifying, um, identifying piece of structure. The founder of the Ottoman Empire was a guy named Usman Bey, um, and he's in, in this painting here. Usman Bey, um, as you can tell, he's got his hand in his sword. He was Usman Bey. Bey means chief, and and Usman um, was uh, what was called a a Ghazi, uh, who's a religious leader who sought to. Um, extend the power and influence of Islam in the modern world by force of sword. And so he was a religious warrior, if you will. This is Mehmed II, Sultan Mehmed II, and he's probably the greatest of the sultans, of the rulers, uh, as he was the ruler um, following the conquest of Constantinople, which was, of course, renamed the uh, Istanbul. Um, and he expanded, continued the expansion of the Ottoman power well into uh, southeastern Europe and the Mediterranean, as well as the Crimea. And there are, um, today, there are Muslim populations in the Balkans, for example, um, and it was during the time of the Ottomans where you have the movement of Islam as a religious faith into southeastern Europe. Um, and of course, um, Islamic countries like Bosnia in southeastern Europe today are certainly evidence of that of the movement of Islam at this time. Now, Mehmed Mehmed II uh, really expanded the Ottoman Empire's realm. The Ottoman Empire was the most expansive and long-lasting of the Islamic empires. Um, it was absolutely, uh, for the longest period of time, the most powerful empire, um, and actually. The uh, Ottomans, who didn't really have that much of a navy, had even put together a navy by um, obtaining um, um, conscripted pirates and, um, and seized vessels. Um, and they actually pushed into the Mediterranean, and it was at the Battle of Lepanto on October 7th, 1571, um, where Mehmed II's expansion uh, was held in check by European powers. Um, particularly the forces of, at that time, the very powerful city-state of Venice and Spain's powerful king, Philip II. Uh, the Battle of Lepanto was the moment in which the, um, in which the Ottoman Turks' expansion into uh, European areas was, was really halted. Some of the most, and this really speaks to the influence of the Ottoman in Europe, some of the most uh, effective uh, and loyal and well-armed of the Ottoman troops, if you would think the, the, the almost like the, um, the most highly specialized and most gung-ho 
um, of the Ottoman troops were actually called the Janissaries, and they were actually um, from European, southeastern European Christian families, and they were actually had been taken from their families from Turkish raids into southeastern Europe, and they were brought up as children um, in the Ottoman court. They were brought up to be devoted to Islam, to be exceptional soldiers and administrators and courageous and well-armed. So they were individuals that were effectively moved, removed from their families and brought up under the tutelage and leadership of the Ottoman sultanates. And so um, they were able to, um, they were able to uh, mold them into this effective and crack fighting force called the Janissaries. Pictured here with early era um, um, firearms, and uh, they would have used these to great effect. And one of the places they would have actually used those firearms to great effect would have been in the, the Battle of Calderon, which was in uh, 1514. And this battle was fought between, so we had the, of course, you know, this is going back a little bit because it's a little bit, we talked about 1571 just a second ago, but we go back just a little bit to 1514. Um, the Ottomans were not only struggling against Europeans and seeking to expand their control and power into Europe, but also against the other Islamic empire to its east, which of course was the Safafid. And at the Battle of Calderon in 1514, it was, this was a major, major battle. It's up near the tip of Iran, near the border with Turkey and Armenia. Uh, see the Safafid map, by the way. Uh, go back after we're done here. But... Um, this was a case in which the Shiites, the Shia, the Shiite, excuse me, the Shiite Safafids and the Sunni Ottomans fought. And the, the, the Ottomans really, really routed the Safafids, largely because the Safafids, you know, were refusing to use gunpowder weapons and were instead attempting to appeal to, to magic through their, uh, their religious faith to protect them, which of course did not work. Um, the Ottomans were very concerned over the spread of what was called Twelver Shiism, uh, which was a mystical form of Shia Islam. And they believed that Shia Islamic faith posed a threat to stability in the um, very different in, in, in Sunni Ottoman realm, and they were trying to prevent the spread of it. Um, and so you look back here and you can really see the origins of some of these very, very ancient differences between Shia and Sunni. And of course, we're very aware of these sectarian divides that still exist today in the region.